Amen. Let's have the children come forward. We've just got a couple today is all. Where'd Letty go? What's that? Oh, currently engaged, yeah. In that little room with the special white throne, yeah. Here comes Kinsley. Come here, I got something to show you. There comes Ashton. Ashton, we haven't seen you for a while. We're glad to have you back. But I know where you've been. You've been on the lake because I see your pictures on Facebook. What'd you do to your head? I see that. Wow, mom and dad are getting tough on you, aren't they? Man. You coming, Kinsley? Come on, mom's coming with you. It'll be fine. Here comes Letty. No resistance. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, life isn't always easy, but we'll see how this goes. Hi! It's all little itty. Well, at least she didn't leave the room, so. You guys have any of these at your house? Any, any of those? Candles? Do you have any of these at your house, Kinsley? Candles? Mom ever? Yeah. <laughs> Big grin. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to try this because I'm not very good at mechanical things, but it worked. There we go. Worked a little bit ago. There is a book in the Bible called Daniel. Have you ever heard of the book of Daniel before? And Daniel's a really good guy, but he gets into a lot of problems because he is around a king, a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. That's a big word, isn't it? Nebuchadnezzar. You can name your next child that. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Call him Neb. That'll be fine, won't it? And when things didn't go King Nebuchadnezzar's way, then he caused a lot of other people heartache. And one of the things that he did, Daddy's back there. Yeah, it's all good. She's all right. Um, one of the things that King Nebuchadnezzar did was told some friends of Daniel that if they didn't do what he told them to do, that they were going to have to go burn up in a fire. Anybody paying attention or no? <laughs> Are you paying attention? No, you're not either? No. Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll just bag this and go. So the moral of the story is, don't put your hand in the fire. You want to put your hand in there? No way. No, it'd burn, wouldn't it? Yeah, it is hot. Can, can you feel it? It is hot. And you don't get near hot things, do you? No. What's the best thing we can do with a candle? Help me. One, two, three. Blow it out. Good job. Yeah, yeah. So the king told Daniel's friends, to go into this big hot fiery furnace and they just walked right in now that would seem like a silly thing to do except they knew that god was with them yeah and then pretty soon out they came and they didn't get burned or anything why because god was with them sometimes we have to do things in life that don't make sense but we have to know that god is with us protecting us and taking care of us so i want you to remember that today don't go sticking your hand in any fire and you don't always have to do what somebody that you don't know tells you to do either. So be careful of that. But just remember that God is always with you. Okay, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for these children that maybe just a little bit of the sticks so that they understand how much you love them. Be with them and guide and direct them. And especially for their parents as they run full tilt. But God, it's all worth the effort. We pray it in your name. Amen. Okay. I don't know who has these little wigglies today, but good luck to him. See, everybody thinks it's hard being a preacher, trust me. Is that God calling Roberta? It wasn't God calling? <laughs> Darn it all. Keep hoping that.
The heat is on. And as you think about it, I don't know why that says no other way. That was last week. Somebody didn't change that slide. I hope the rest of them on there are right. I think I just forgot to change the title slide. I was telling somebody the other day that when God moves me to do sermon planning, which probably isn't often enough, I take little note cards and I'll put down maybe a scripture that I've read that struck, struck me that God's saying, preach on that. And I'll just make some notes on that and put it aside and I clip them all together. And then week to week, I'll go through those cards and see if I feel moved to preach on any of those subjects that I've got. Like I've got one sticking in there right now for our Taylor Lake Sunday. There was something that moved me a couple months ago and so it's gonna sit there in the pile until the Taylor Lake Sunday. Well, I had put this one down and I had picked the title, The Heat Is On, not no other way. That was last week. <laughs> um, but um, because I thought it's hot, right? That time of the year, it has been hot. I was so grateful for the life-giving rain and that it cooled it down. And even though it brought humidity, I was grateful for all of that. And little did I know on Sunday night, Monday, when I picked that card out of the pile and picked it more for the, the timing with the time of year, that it was going to become a really important subject to a number of people within our congregation. So while I don't prepare messages to preach at you, oftentimes they speak to you because God has perfectly aligned that, and I feel that very much today um, with this subject from the book of Daniel. Let me give you a little thought here that for you note takers, you may want to write this down because this is critical to know and to understand. And hopefully if I've got the right slides, this will show up. Do we have one that says faith that can't be tested can't be trusted? Faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. It's the same reason that when you buy a vehicle, you know that before it's ever hit the market, they've had it out on those big, fancy, expensive test track for maybe years before they release the model to make sure, hopefully, that the safety features work, that it drives right, that you'll be safe on the road. It's the same reason that with new medications that come out, often you hear about it and it's years and years and years before it hits the market because they're doing testing to hopefully make sure it's as safe as possible for those that will be taking that medication. There's a million other examples about testing in the world. There's all kinds of tests that go on on a regular basis. We test children in school because we want to make sure that they're going towards their achievement level. Otherwise, you don't know where they're at, and we need to make sure that they're moving forward, moving upward in their education. But our faith is tested again and again. Amen? Amen? It never lets up, does it? You might even be able to think back to times when you were a young child. You may not have realized it then, but your faith was being tested even then. Maybe there's some of you that are under a test of faith right now. In fact, I know that there are some. That there is a test of faith going on in your life right now. Well, why is it that our faith is tested again and again? You know, when I was little, my, my most favorite question to ask an adult was, why? 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 Well, why did I ask that again and again? Because I was testing the boundaries of the pond. And I wanted to know if someone could give me a good answer to that question of why. Testing the boundaries. Why is our faith tested again and again? Because, my friends, when our faith is tested, we find out that it is the only way that we can fully rely on God. Dexter, you got my little green friend there? There he is. 
Everybody's probably heard this. Frog, fully rely on God. It comes from Isaiah 26.4. I actually just love the little peeper. They hang on my window and look in. Today's scripture is an incredible demonstration of the ultimate test of faith. And I planted that seed a little bit with the children up here. It's a familiar story to many and one that many of us can relate to. We're going to hop around in chapter 3 of Daniel, verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 18, and then I'm going to try to fill in the rest of the story for you because chapter 3 is just too much to read all at once. So I'm going to give you some highlights. If you've got your Bible with you or there's one in your pew, turn to Daniel, a little bit in the middle to the back. Chapter 3. Verses 1 through 6 for start. And I'm reading from the NLT, so if you've got the NIV, it'll be a little bit different. King Nebuchadnezzar. Now listen, I ought to get a bonus just for being able to say that, right? <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the, the, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then a herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Skip over then to 16 through 18 where we see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God that we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be King Nebuchadnezzar was one of those people that we could describe as being just full of himself. It doesn't take much reading in the book of Daniel to see that. Everything that he did was all about me, 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 me. Look at me, worship me, bow down to my God, my symbols, me, me, me. He was more than willing to exhibit that, and he had no uh, reservations whatsoever about letting everyone know that he was the king and was in charge. So he came up with this idea to build this huge, what the Bible calls, image. And I read another version, and I can't remember what those cubit things convert to, but it was, it was huge. This gold statue was way high and way wide, and it wasn't just painted gold. It was gold. You couldn't miss it. It shone from forever away. And so he built this image or this statue, and he issued this edict that every time the music played, I kind of call it Nebuchadnezzar's musical chairs. Every time the music played, the people had to fall down and worship this statue. And if you didn't, what was going to happen? You're going to be thrown into the fire. They made no, minced no words about it. This is the way it's going to be. Got to do this or you're going to die. 
It's interesting here to note the events that led up to this point, and I think it's good to have a little bit of history because you can put the whole picture together. You see, Daniel was the son of a king, and Nebuchadnezzar's soldier seized Babylon where Daniel's family ruled, and some of the royal family was picked by the soldiers during this inquest, I guess you would say, and were brought to Judah where Nebuchadnezzar ruled. Daniel and, and a few of his friends that were chosen began to be trained, I think it was on a three-year time period, to be servants in the king's court, but not just servants, higher up servants, high in the court. These guys were handsome young men, they looked good, and Nebuchadnezzar was all about appearances. So these guys were hand-picked, and they were brought in for training. And they would be, during this training, provided with prime housing and prime food so that they could continue to be and develop even into more prime specimens so that Nebuchadnezzar could say, look what I did. Look at my court. Well, Daniel didn't buy into the whole thing in any way, shape, or form. Daniel had always honored his body as God's temple. And he was very careful about what he ate. He primarily ate vegetables and a little bit of fruit and was very particular even in that arena. I guess we would call him today sort of a, a, sort of a, a previous health food nut. He took care of himself and his body showed it. And so the officer in charge of training these chosen young men got worried because Daniel wouldn't eat. You see, what was going on was that the king, being big and bad and tough like he was, had the richest, finest food that could be prepared that money could buy all kinds of pastries and gooeys and yummies and all those things that we all love to eat. But Daniel said, no way, no how, those don't create a healthy body. I'm going to eat these few very select things. Well, it wasn't what he was provided with, and so he began to kind of wither. He wasn't doing well. He wasn't thriving. And the guard who was in charge of taking the food and doing the training with these guys got really concerned. How in the world was he going to get Daniel to grow big and strong? And knowing King Nebuchadnezzar, if this guard, if this training guard didn't get Daniel in shape, the training guard was probably going to get the axe as well. So he started to talk to Daniel a little bit. And... He had a little chat explaining the situation, and then Daniel had a little chat back and explained his situation, and he said, I'll eat, and I'll work out, and I'll do what's needed as long as you bring me the food that I want to nourish my body. I'm not going to eat this other stuff. I'll starve to death before I'll eat that, so bring me my preferred vegetables and fruit and healthy foods and myself and my buddies will all eat them. And I guarantee you that if you give us a 10-day time period, 10 days with the healthy food that we desire and water, good, clean water to drink, you're going to see a huge difference. Amen. So the guard, I knew, Alan, you were aching for that, weren't you? So the guard, not knowing what else to do, said, okay, so he started sneaking in all the things that Daniel and his three buddies wanted there together, and he began to compare what was going on over the 10-day period. And what happened in that just 10-day period was remarkable. Now, I could do a sidebar and talk about how it takes so little time to start get healthy, right? But, but in 10 days... The comparison was incredible. And these guys started to grow strong and they started to get muscular and they started to do really well because they were honoring their bodies. They were honoring God with their bodies and in turn, God was honoring them. 
So in all of this, with Daniel's focus on pleasing God and doing what God uh, asked him to do, God gifted Daniel with the ability to interpret dreams and visions. Okay? So Daniel and his friends finished their training over this three-year period, and they went into service to the king. But King Nebuchadnezzar had been and continued to be troubled by dreams and visions. Are you seeing God's perfect provision here? King Nebuchadnezzar couldn't get a good night's sleep. He had nightmares. He had night terrors. He had asked all of his astrologers and magicians and sorcerers to interpret these dreams, but nobody could. Nobody could make any sense out of it. So like any good type A personality king would do, he had all of those people put to death. Well, if you can't give me the answer I want, then off with your head. Enter Daniel, God's perfect provision. Daniel fearlessly interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, and all the while he took the opportunity to praise God. To praise God for provision, planting the seed with King Nebuchadnezzar. So the short story is this. King In was so grateful and impressed that he fell on his knees in front of Daniel and expressed his allegiance and belief to Daniel's God, the same God of you and I today. If only that were the end of the story. This is a great lesson, my friends, in the power of fellowship and accountability. The problem was that King Nebuchadnezzar's heart didn't change at all. But chapter 3 shows him right back to his old tricks and his, his old tricks of power and control of other people. He had the statue built, he had the edict given, and was going to kill those who didn't comply. Any questions about that? In the mix of all this, there were what I call the tattlers. Anybody ever have a little kid in your house that was a tattler? Mom, he did so-and-so. Mom, God. you know what I'm talking about. There are adults who are tattlers. And there were a group of adult people in the king's court who I would call the tattlers who went to King Nebuchadnezzar and said, the Jews won't bow down and worship the statue. The Jews won't bow down and worship the statue. And the king became furious. Absolutely furious. So this ever not so wise king after questioning Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends, who still, like Daniel, held fast to their beliefs in God, the king ordered them tossed into a fiery furnace. Now, you might ask, how hot was it? Okay, you can ask with me. How hot was it? Who knows? The Bible tells us specifically. Seven times normal. Seven times a normal furnace. And this was not... A furnace furnace. This was like an industrial furnace where they made bricks and they melted down metal and made, I guess, the forerunner to steel. This was hotter than hot. It was so hot. Oh, you guys are good. That the soldiers walking this trio of guys up to the furnace died. They burned up 20 feet away from the furnace before they even got there. The bound trio, though, knew that God was there ahead of them, and they just bound up, just walked right on into the furnace, right on into the fire. So as King, far enough away, of course, that he isn't going to get hurt, had a front row seat looking into the fire. I thought this was a great graphic of what that might have looked like in this fiery furnace. 
And King Nebuchadnezzar was looking into the fire from afar. He gasped when he could see the outline of the trio still alive and in there walking around. But what got him even more was that he saw a fourth figure there with him. Their trial by fire caused a change of heart in the king once again. And as they began to walk out of the fire, still fully clothed, not a bit of scorch or dirt or anything on them, Nebuchadnezzar knew once again that there was something bigger than him. And again, these guys praised God all the way in walking into the furnace, and they were praising God and singing his praises, walking all the way out. Skipping, I can even imagine, as they came out. Hey, King Neb, how's it going, buddy? <laughs> the king joined in the praise once again, professed his belief in God, our God, of heaven and earth. Now you see, this experience of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego helps us to examine our own faith and determine how deeply we really trust God. You know, when the heat is on, oftentimes the reality of who we really are and how faithful we really are comes right to the surface, doesn't it? And can we agree right now that we can overcome anything if we trust God completely. Can we agree on that? Amen. Now remember, trusting God completely in provision doesn't mean the provision's going to be what we want it to be. We can give God that checklist. God, if you'll only do this and this and this and this and I need, you know. And then it doesn't turn out that way. And then we say, well, God didn't answer my prayer. He didn't give me provision. Well, yes, he does. He gives you provision because of his ultimate promise of eternity. And anything in between is just stuff. It's just a test of your faith. And the test of your faith becomes a testament to other people. And you see how it goes full circle. So I ask you a question today, and that question is, are you prepared to take a stand for God no matter what? Don't answer that yes without really thinking it through. Are you willing to take a stand for God no matter what? Because I tell you, friends, when you stand for God, and I mean really stand for him, you're going to stand out. And there's going to be some criticism. There's going to be some name-calling. You're going to lose family and friends because that's the way that it is. It may be, and my friends, often is painful. And it may not always have the happy ending that we would desire. But our commitment to God has has to be to serve him whether he rescues us or not. Amen? We go back to our picture again of those three bound guys right there in the furnace. Led into this industrial type furnace heated to seven times hotter than normal. Certain many observers standing around looked away because what good could come of any of this? I think a lot of people fear death by fire. Certainly we should. Scary, horrible thing. I mean, you just burn your finger and it hurts and hurts and hurts. But to walk into a fire... But these three guys never missed a step. And they walked right in, and they never missed a beat in their faith. They're just walking around in there until God said, go. Now, we don't know how long they were in there. They could have been in there for a few minutes. They could have been in there for days or weeks. Do you see the symbolism of that? 
how God will walk you into a fire and in this case use them as a mighty tool for others to understand the power of God. And certainly, don't you think their faith was strengthened? That they trusted God that much, and in the end, when they walked out, can you imagine? I would think their heads would have just been swimming. And that fourth figure walking in there around with them, none other than God himself. We don't know if the guys could see him or this figure while they were in the fire together. The scripture doesn't address that. But trust me, God was right there in the fire with them. You ever been there? Where God is in the fire with you and you don't see a way out and you don't understand why you're there and all this is going on. Usually it's later you look back and go, man, God was with me the whole time. And in fact, God might even carry you into the fire, but guess what? He's going to carry you right back out, and boy, are you going to be better for it in the end. This story is just a great testament as to how true faith confounds the enemy. The enemy's always looking at some way to distract us and get us off center, right? Right? But it's also a testament to how difficult true faith can be. These guys knew that God would deliver them, but they weren't presumptuous as to how that would be. Part of the scripture says in there, well, you know, we don't know how it's going to turn out for us physically right here on earth, but we know in the end that God's in control and that he's going to have perfect provision. And for that, send us in. Here we go. Got our frog picture there again, Dexter. There he is. Have you ever been through some fiery furnaces in your life? I would say from what I know, now in the eighth year of ministry here, I know most of you pretty well. And I know that there's been some fiery furnaces for the majority of you, one way or the other. And some of you are still in those right now and wondering why. And you wonder sometimes if you will ever get out of those fiery furnace situations. But as you look back, ask yourself, has my faith grown stronger as a result of that fire or did I just let it fly out the window when I was being tested? Did I go right back to my own devices and try to get control and try to do something when God had it under control the whole time? Remember what I said at the very start, and I encouraged you as note takers to write it down. Faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. It's like that saying of, you know, we want to be on the mountaintop. But the reality is if we're always on the mountaintop, we don't get any stronger. It's in the valleys where we grow, and then we go back to the mountaintop and the world sees us and sees what we've been through or what we're going through, and it makes all the difference in the world. So we as people of faith, my friends must accept the trials of this life knowing that we're going to come out stronger. Don't curse those trials. Welcome those trials and say, I'm not in it alone. I may feel alone. I may be alone in my physical surroundings, but God is with me. And those trials of faith aren't punishment, although they often feel like it, don't they? Boy, do they feel like punishment when you're going through it. Trials of faith are a kind of a spiritual exercise that helps us to get fit for the next trial. And the more faith fit that we are, the better that we can serve God. So have faith, my friends. Keep the faith, my friends. Trust your faith and trust God to use that faith to get you through the trials of this life. 
You've had many. There'll be many more. But God is with you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the message from Daniel. It's so graphic. And we can get such a visual on a faith that we can't even really imagine. Sometimes we think of it as a Bible story, but it's not a story. It is truly about having faith and doing what you guide us to do. So, Father, give us strength to do exactly that as we leave this place and as the trials of life continue on. Let us have faith to know that you're in control. You're already there. And no matter what the outcome is here on this earth, that you have a plan for us on the other side. We have faith and we trust you and we love you, Lord, and we pray it in your name. Amen. Would you stand together for our closing number? When we all get to heaven, when we all get to heaven, just in case anybody was in doubt. Ladies that know about the doves on the aprons. Um, Joyce has some things prepared she wants to share with you in the fellowship hall. If you'd run out there and meet with her and take a look-see, she would appreciate that. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be there without those that I love and those that I know. I can't really think of anybody that I don't want to have there with me. So we've got a job to do. We've got to step out in faith. We've got to profess our faith, 
Tell your story, my friends. Everybody has a story, and a lot of times, most of the time, that story is not an easy thing. It's of strife, it's of difficulty, but people will see you as real and understand that God has carried you through. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we get to heaven. A lot of people say, I've got so many questions. Well, me too, but we won't get to ask them because they won't matter. (laughs) It won't matter. But we will be looking for those that we love and care about and have been acquainted with. So we have a job to do. We leave this place that we call the church and we go out and we be the church. Amen. Amen. Take that out and let people know that your faith has to be tested. That just because you raise your hand, say I'm a Christian, you do the dip in baptism and give your life to Christ. That's just the beginning of your troubles. (laughs) But God is there. And he has a plan. And God is good all the time. time. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your message today through Daniel. That as we walk through the fiery furnaces in life, that we're reminded that you are there ahead of us. We thank you for this day. I thank you for this gathering of friends that will leave here today. And they will be the church to someone that needs to know. And I know that many of them are dealing with friends and family that don't know you, that they've tried and tried and tried to no avail, but God, you never give up. And so you give us the strength to never give up. And so I pray that strength for each person and what they go through this week, that they can never give up telling the story of faith and your goodness. God, be with us. We pray it in your precious and your holy name. Amen.